Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Under Torah Book Launch with Rabbi Jill Hammer. Thank you so much to Kohenet Renee Finkelstein for that beautiful opening song. My name is Rachel Kunstadt, and I am the Director of Adult Jewish Learning at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan, where, among other program areas, I oversee Makom, our Department for Jewish Meditation and Spirituality. Makom, as well as the Greater JCC, is thrilled and honored to bring you this evening's program with Rabbi Jill, who is a longtime beloved collaborator of ours and member of our community. This evening is going to be a magical, mystical experience like dreams themselves. Thank you to Ayn Press, the Kohenet Priestess Institute, and Romamu for co-sponsoring this event. We ask you to please stay muted to minimize background noise and if possible, to turn your video on to join in our sacred community. Without further ado, I'm happy to turn it over to our host for this evening, Kohenet Shamira. Rabbi Jill Hammer writes of a dream she had. God said to me, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to give you wings to make you fly. But no one will listen to me because I have wings. Everyone will think I am strange. But God said, you will see people will listen to you. My teacher, my friend, my colleague, the person who brought me in and ordained me as a Kohenet, Jill, we are here, hundreds of us today, to celebrate this amazing, amazing, amazing accomplishment of this book. You have taught us that a dream is a gift. And your book to all of us is a gift to us, a gift to our lives, a gift to our souls. We read in the Zohar, alas, for the one who regards the Torah as a mere book of tales and profane matters. If this were so, and by the way, we know a few people who might still think this, if this were so, we might today even write a Torah dealing in such matters and still more excellent. In regard to earthly things, the kings and princes of the world possess more valuable materials. We could use them as a model for composing a Torah of this kind. But in reality, the words of Torah are higher words and higher mysteries. And we are so lucky to have you in this plane on a cellular level, even though we're on Zoom, the fact that we can be connected to these pages, these iron press pages on a cellular level. In my first few weeks after graduating college and my first ever job at the JCC in Manhattan, I couldn't have imagined that the quiet person who walked the hallways on the other side of the office would become this teacher to bring so many of us these gifts, giving us wings to fly and reminding us that something that might have seen, that might have seemed to be just a dream could actually be something that heals, opens portals, gives us a connection to prophecy and can shift our notions of divinity and prophecy. We are so thrilled to be here together to celebrate this book and to celebrate you, Jill, tonight. I'm going to be your host and I'll be telling you right now what is going to be happening throughout our evening together. First, we are going to have an interview with Jill by Dory Midnight and I will introduce both of them formally in just a moment. Then we will hear an original song from the absolutely fabulous Chazan Basya Schechter. We will have an opportunity to engage and taste dream practice with Jill herself. 
Then there will be an open time for Q&A. Folks can write in the chat even uh, throughout the night, and then there'll be an official moment where you can write your questions in the chat, and we will get to hear from, from Jill your, your reflections on those questions. We will hear from our publishers from I Impress, and we will have a chance to share some, some blessings at the end. And we'll be here for about an hour and a half. So again, we encourage folks to keep your videos on if you are able to and listen in. If you aren't able to have your video on, we're just so happy that you all are here. There is so, so, so much to celebrate and so much to honor. We are about to hear an interview with our featured author and with Dory Midnight. I'm gonna introduce them now. Rabbi Jill Hammer, PhD, author, scholar, ritualist, poet, midrashist, Kohenet, and dream worker. May, may, you may know her as the spiritual director of education at the Academy for Jewish Religion and the co-founder of Kohenet Hebrew Priests Institute. She is the author of the book we are celebrating tonight, Under Torah, an earth-based Kabbalah of dreaming, as well as many other books such as Return to the Place, The Magic Meditation and Mystery of Sefer Yetzirah, The Hebrew Priestess, Ancient and New Visions of Women's Spiritual Leadership with Taya Sher, A Jewish Book of Days, A Companion for All Seasons, Sisters at Sinai, New Tales of Biblical Women, and other books. She sees her primary work as guiding people to enter the dream world through dreams, journeys, stories, and sacred texts for transformation and for healing. I now bring up to the stage Dory Midnight, who is my Kohenet sibling. Dory is a community healer, community healing practitioner, ritual artist, writer, and deep listener oriented towards healing and liberation. For over 20 years, Dory has practiced intuitive healing rooted in and guided by Jewish ancestral traditions, feminist, decolonial, and abolitionist scholarship, queer liberation, and disability in healing justice work. Drawing on ancestral wisdom, wisdom from her Sephardi and Ashkenazi lineage, Dory teaches workshops on ritual and remedies for unraveling times, remembering and reconnecting with traditions of Jewish ancestral wisdom as liberatory practice and queer magic and healing. It is my honor to pass the mic to you, Dory, to interview our author tonight. Thank you so much, Shamira. That was such a beautiful introduction. And hi, Jill, I'm just so grateful and excited and ecstatic to get to talk to you and be with all of these people in this dream of a dream tonight. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dory. Thank you so much for being here. I'm already so moved and overwhelmed by Renee's song, Lakuna Renee's song, and Kohenet Shamir's introduction, and, and uh, Rachel's really kind words, and everyone's presence here. It wow. really does feel like a dream. <laughs> Very much. I, I want to start us off. I'm so excited to ask you so many questions about this beautiful book, which I'm so personally grateful for. It just, it feels like it's such a generous gift to have this dream book. It's like a book of my dreams to have um, this guidance and wisdom that is Jewish and feminist and earth-based and um, magical. And I'm so grateful. And it's it's already been such an incredible um, guide for me in my own dreaming. But I want to I want to start us off where you invite us, um, which is under the earth, um, with the title of the book under Torah, and you kind of you locate us in this underground temple, um, in this realm that kind of turns the canonical understanding of Revelation upside down. So rather than receiving from above to one person, there's this kind of bubbling up from below, almost mycelial um, access for many, for all of us, um, and, and, and a kind of like depth and, and darkness. And I was wondering if you could talk 
about this title and this realm and this dimension as you understand it of, of under Torah? Mm. Thank you so much for this, for this question. So I want to tell a, a little bit of a dream story, and then I want to read two paragraphs from the book of an answer to this, an answer to this question about why under Torah. Firstly, the title really comes from, from dreams that I've had. You mentioned one of them, the dream of, sort of being in a temple in Jerusalem and then finding out that there was a crack that went into the earth. And then if you followed it, there was an underground river. And if you followed that, there were, you know, there were lava vents. Uh, and I noticed that in a number of my dreams, I kept trying to get there. I kept trying to get to some place under the earth uh, that was deeper than where I was. And it began to give me a sense of the ways that dreams were seemed to be guiding me sort of into this deeper place that it was an encoding as a place under the, under the ground. You know, but for some people it's, you know, in a tree or it's, you know, on a cloud, it's, it's not always under the ground, but for me, that's where it was. And so I began to think of dreams as a place that, that takes us deeper you know, and, and not only deeper as in kind of emotionally deeper, which they do, but, uh, but, but actually deeper into our experience of being a being connected to other beings, right? That dreams, soften the ego wall, you know, it, it, we don't have such a clear narrative or such a clear idea of who we are. And so there's a way that we're much more permeable. Uh, and I think that that's also true when we're in connection with the earth. Uh, and I love that view of revelation, and right? I love the idea that revelation is something that can seep into all of us, right? Rather than you know, being uh, sent, you know, via one particular vector to one particular person. Uh, and I just wanted to read this, this one paragraph um, from the opening of, uh, of Under Torah. Returning to the dream means returning to the image, to the indeterminate, to the non-linear, and to voices that have been suppressed or marginalized. If canonical revelation in Jewish tradition, which comes from above to below, is called Torah, we might call the dream word the Under Torah a deep well of truth that lies hidden and bubbles up from beneath, shifting our notions of divinity and prophecy. Not only are dreams not codified texts, they are not even text. They are images accompanied by feelings and voices. We may construct narratives out of them, but these narratives generally do not make sense according to our waking minds. Dream images unmoored from linear thought and normative expectation have the potential to introduce something original into our minds, a seed that can grow an idea, a transformation, even a new way of being. This is the essence of revelation. I might even say that right, the stories of Torah are themselves you know, a, a manifestation of under Torah right, as, as mm -hmm. text. And, uh, mm -hmm. But the, the depth of under Torah we can reach in all kinds of ways, including our dreams. It's so beautiful and it's so profoundly, it's radical um, in terms of like being so accessible to everyone, right? And, you know, you, you don't say it explicitly in the book, but it's such a feminist view um, in terms of being able to kind of like really toppling hierarchy, like in the hierarchy of revelation. And one of the things that I really love in this book is the way that you talk about the the radical nature of dreaming and of dream work and um and I, I think you're speaking to that a little bit in, in this of just like everyone of prophecy being able to seep into all of us but you also talk about the radical nature of dream work at, also as a collective practice as something that we do communally um which is quite liberatory I was wondering if you could share a little bit about your um about this idea of this radical nature of both dreaming and of dream work. Yeah, thank you. Um, dream work is radical on multiple levels. Uh, it's radical, first of all, because we're, we're, many of us are living in a rationalist society, right? Where dreams are sort of, you know, some kind of debris from waking life, you know, that we shouldn't pay attention to, or that is so particular to us that why would anybody else care, right? That's, you know, that, and, you know, we're supposed to be attuned to things that are more uh, observable, right? Uh, and so dream work is radical, first of all, in raising what is in many cultures an indigenous practice, 
right? And is, you know, an ancient practice, you know, from many different spiritual traditions um, of taking these nonlinear, right? Non-logical uh, nighttime revelations as real information, right? As useful wisdom. So that's one way that uh, dream work is radical is by raising up what is really an earlier way of our ancestors uh, sacred practice. It's also radical, um, I think because dreams have become the, the province of, the, of psychology, right? And you know, this kind of dream work also really takes dreams as a spiritual practice, right? And that's also, that also has a radical, you know, has a radical uh, element. And the final thing that I want to add here is that dreams are radical by their nature because dreams do not care what the rules are. They do not care what God is supposed to look like. They do not care what you are supposed to look like. They do not care about gravity, right? They, they're, they're, dreams are very tuned into um, you know, a network of feelings and images that it's not bound by social convention. And that's part of why they can introduce radical ideas, um, you know, and, and radical healing into our lives. Uh, so I absolutely think it's a radical practice and, and it's a really beneficial one. Thank you. Yes. Well, I think some, I, what I, one of the things that is, that I, that I think you're getting at is this idea of like, and I think this is part of your work at large in your life of sort of shifting what we understand as sacred text in Judaism. And by locating the, like, dreams as under Torah, as Torah, as prophecy, as revelation, um, you honor them as sacred texts, you honor dreaming as spiritual practice. Um, but I'm also thinking about your book in this lineage of Jewish text. You know, in, the, in your book, you draw on dream wisdom from the Zohar, from the Kabbalah, from the um, uh, from the Talmud. And I can't help but think of like, you know, I think when I imagine you in this lineage of, of dream workers, of, of visionaries, of teachers, of wise ones, like, do you have a sense of this text, your text in this lineage of Jewish dream wisdom? Mm. Wow, I love that. You know, I feel like there are these two strands in, in Jewish dream wisdom, you know, from the, from the very beginning, right? There's this strand that starts in Genesis where the primary way that people receive spiritual knowledge is through dreams, right? Or through visions that are dreamlike, right? That's the, and then as text becomes the dominant way by which people receive revelation, right? Dreams don't go away, they never go away but they begin to become something that makes people nervous, right? Roger Kamenetz talks about this in his book, The History of Last Night's Dream, right? That there starts to be anxiety about dreams as revelation because what if they contradict what we think is supposed to be revelation? And, and yet Jews keep picking up that side of the thread and weaving it back in. You know, so the Talmud you know, has a whole section where it talks about dreams and says that they're one sixtieth of revelation, right? Which seems to mean Right, that yeah, there's some revelation in them, but you kind of have to sort it out, right? And you know, some of it's kind of nonsense and some of it is amazing and you have to sort of sort it. But they also were saying that because they don't want to make it equal, right? They want it to remain a, a subcategory of, of revelatory wisdom, but not the dominant one. You know, and then the mystics come along, right? The Kabbalists come along and they are really coming back into a sense of dream, whether that's sleeping dream or waking dream, right, as a way that they are in touch with, you know, what's going on behind the cosmic curtain. Uh, and so for them, dreams are actually a journey of the soul, right, so where you, you know, you actually leave your body at night and you go to this amazing realm and you get information and then you come back. So I, I see myself very much as in that second thread, you know, that I'm, I'm interested in how we can use the dream journey, you know, as a form of um, self-reflection, as a form of learning, you know, as a, as a way of healing uh, that, you know, that is a, uh, 
that we take seriously, right, as a spiritual experience. Um, so I very much see myself in that way. Uh, so you no, know, I think I, I put myself in the, you know, in the uh, Zohar's camp. Uh, and then I would also say, uh, Chaim Vital, who was a, um, an important student of Isaac Luria, the Kabbalist, uh, the great Kabbalist, said, uh, kept a diary, and he wrote down not only his own dreams, but dreams of other people. And he wrote down dreams of women in the Kabbalistic community who were dreaming and talking about their dreams as sources of revelation. Uh, and so we get their dreams because he wrote them down. And I probably, if there was a single text that I would pick as you know, a predecessor to my book, I think I would pick those sections of his diary because I love uh, the ways that dreams become not only a, a kind of spiritual practice and reflection, but a way in which Chavrutas in which two people who are in, in connection can talk with one another at depth, right? Dreams allow us not just to learn something about ourselves, but actually to be in community in a deeper way. And you really see that in my diary. Mm, that is so beautiful to, to think about your book in conversation and connection and like in dream, like also thinking about you in Dream Chavruta with all of these dreamers and with Chaim Vital too. Um, I just can, I can feel that dream. Um, I, I really like, I think this idea of um, honoring the dream as, as sacred text um, and like the, the love and devotion of the source as earth and then this other piece that I think is really in counter to a lot of sort of the more um, psychological frames, uh, more contemporary frames around dream work, where rather than looking at dreams as symbols or like in a kind of language of symbols or metaphor, you really talk about dreams as an embodied experience. Um, and so then like, our, our bodies then become also the site of revelation and prophecy. Our bodies are like where this happens rather than somebody else delivering it to us. And I think that's also so radical and profound and, um, and, and validating and such an invitation um, to get to experience our dreams. Um, I don't know, just the way that, that we think we, because we're asleep, we're not really thinking about what's happening to our bodies. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to this idea of um, dreams as an embodied experience. Yeah, this is for me, uh, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book uh, was to talk, was to express something about this, about the, um, the ways that we dream as bodies and we dream in connection to the, the earth as a body. Uh, because a lot of what happens to us in dreams really comes out of sensations, right? That we might have not been paying lots of attention to, right? In waking life, but that comes back, you know, kind of comes roaring back in our sleep, you know, and they can be anything from sort of amazing wonder, right? To complete terror, right? And, and dreams kind of don't stop at the edge, you know, they, they really um, uh, allow us to inhabit those feelings in a full way, you know, in a way that we might not, uh, always inhabit them, right, in waking life, because we have all kinds of breaks on those experiences, right, that we don't have in our dreams. And I really see the dream as, um, let me see if I can find the, the other passage I wanted to read here. Um, the, um, the way that they are, um, uh, that they allow for the subliminal to be manifest. And I think that this is very important from the embodied piece. Um, so, you know, here's a thing that I wrote. Um, Dream images show us our fundamental connection to being, to the world of plants, animals, earth, and stars, what David Abram calls the more than human world. We can never fully perceive the being that holds us. We can't see the electrons or touch the stars that send their light to us from a, such a great difference, distance. Nor can we see the cosmos inside us, the inner workings of our neurons, muscle, and bone. These things are what author and eco ecologist Stephen Hardin calls the scientific invisibles, the atoms, microbes, and feedback relationships that make up the astonishing body of our living earth. It's somewhere within us, we viscerally know the truth of our organ origins. 
that we are an organic particle of a vast living cosmos we can barely comprehend. So I see dreams as a time when the subliminal becomes you know, uh, overt. Uh, and, and so much of the subliminal is what we take in through our bodies. And, and that's why, although you know, there, there is a, a value to talking about the symbolic language of dreams, I'm much more interested in the way that dreams are a network of experiences. Right, that are bringing us visuals and sounds and sense and sensations, right, in a, in a way that um, that is bigger, right, than what we could normally hold because normally we're you know we're holding our our own consciousness with such uh, ferocity, you know, and, and in dreams we uh, you know we're not. So I, I do see them as an embodied experience and. And I think often they tell us the truth of the body. And this is why sometimes a dream comes along that either tells you something that you had no idea, you know, that maybe you knew, but had no idea you knew, or gives you ad healing advice that you couldn't possibly have come up with on your own, right? Because there's, because the dream is allowing wisdom to seep in, right? That we, we couldn't necessarily gather in our waking consciousness. Mm. Yes, uh, I, this is like, you know, I want to ask you, of course, about dreams as a source of healing and of healing wisdom. And, you know, I, I'm so delighted and um, blessed that I have two dreams in this book, which they're not under my name. So everyone here is going to have to guess what they are. But one of them is about you. And, um, and you actually giving me guidance around uh, doing some really big healing work. And, um, and I, I'm just like wanting to connect, like here you make these connections with both the ways in which dreams are an embodied experience and therefore that we have like the possibilities for healing within them and also receiving healing wisdom. and. Um, and like who we meet in our dreams um, as sources of healing and guidance and wisdom. So I think that will probably be our last question. Is that right, Shamira? Yeah, so if you could talk a little bit about, um, yeah, your understanding of the possibilities of healing within dreaming. Sure, thank you, Dory. I, I love that dream. It's, it's, the, it's the most awesome dream. They're all awesome. And this one is awesome in its own unique way. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was one of the joys as I began to um, interview people, in addition to reading texts and, you know, thinking about my own dreams, I did a lot of interviewing people uh, to prepare for writing the book. And one of the things that was astonishing was the, was the healing stories that people told me. And some of them were very direct and miraculous, you know, like, I was deeply depressed and then somebody gave me this food in a dream and I woke up and I wasn't depressed anymore, you know, or, you know, I was in the hospital, you know, with a heart condition and an angel came in my dream and then I, you know, the doctors couldn't find the heart condition anymore. Or, you know, I had a, you know, I was in a car accident in my dream and then I was in the same car accident in waking life and I knew what to do because of the dream. Like, so some of them are like, just profound. You can't, you, you can't even believe the stories. Um, and then some of them are much more subtle. You know, like I'm, I'm having trouble in a particular relationship and then that person shows up in my dream and, and you know, and I give them a hug. So I give them a hug in real life and that shifts the relationship. You know, or, um, you know, someone is, you know, lost in their dream and, and somebody helps them and, 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 and it becomes a reflection on how can I ask for help right, when I need it. Um, in one of the dreams, you know, somebody who's having trouble expressing themselves, you know, pries their mouth open, you know, with using a tree. You know, so sometimes the imagery is very direct, like do this and you'll, you'll be better, right? And, and sometimes it's, it's much more subtle or, um, in a, you know, much, uh, much more in sort of our normal dream vocabulary, you know, but there's, there's real power in it. There's, and it's, I think one of the reasons to pay attention to dreams um, is that you have the potential, you know, for these, um, these offerings that can really uh, affect and change our waking lives, um, not just be you know, interesting, cool, you know, scary, exciting, uh, but, but have real impact, especially when we're paying attention. Um, and uh, you know, the book talks you know, 
a bit about some of the things you can do to pay more attention to the dreams and, and, and get some of this wonderful juice out of them. Mm, thank you. I'm so, it's like, it's so generous to have not only all of these people's dreams and the way that you hold them, but then this, these gems of dream practices um, that you share with us that we can do. And I, it sounds like we're going to be getting to do one of your dream practices tonight too. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your always thank you. And thank you for this moment of all of this wisdom and this beautiful book. It's such a profound joy and honor to get to just like sit at your feet and um, learn from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dory. Thank you for the amazing interview. Thank you for your revelatory dreaming. Mm. And uh, yeah, just so grateful to be in conversation uh, with you always uh, in the dream world and in the waking world. <laughs> um, I, uh, in addition to thanking Dory, I also want to say that we're about to hear a gorgeous piece of music uh, from uh, Chazan Basha Schechter, uh, the, um, the uh, extraordinary uh, vocalist and composer and musician. And uh, we have been talking about Zohar quotes around dreaming uh, and the ways that the mystics have uh, talked about dreaming. Uh, and uh, this musical piece comes out of, the, comes out of one of those. And I, I know Basha is about to say more. Thank you, Basha, for being here. Thank you so much, Jill. It's such a pleasure and it's such an honor. <clears throat> you are my guide for uh, dreaming. I think the very first time I engaged in dream work, I was in Isabella Freeman and you had me put a stone underneath my pillow and say like, that's like, and then I started putting a stone under my pillow every night. And then I started dreaming. And then I ran into you at a bat mitzvah and then you had me meet Roger Kamenetz and read his book. So I feel like you're my guide. And um, I feel like I just want to sit at your feet um, when it comes to this and comes to many things. Um, and I think there's um, this quote that you sent me from some of the pieces from the Zohar that you were inspired by in the writing of your book. And, um, and so I just composed um, one of these Zohar quotes. And I love this quote because it's something that I've been doing. I'm in Costa Rica right now with my son and I haven't actually dreamt since he was born. And you told me also that he's, that I'm gonna start dreaming maybe in a few years when I stop waking up to mom, you know, then I'm gonna start dreaming again. But um, for now, my dreams are a little, uh, a little on the shaky side, but um, you, uh, I, I just quote the first one that you shared with me is one that is just so beautiful. And I've been laying down in bed at night before going to sleep with this quote, um, that's just like stripping the clothes of everything that we wear in our waking lives, all the defenses, all our cover-ups, everything that we present to the world and all of it comes off. And so I just lay in bed and imagine everything removed from me, everything removed. And then their soul takes its journey. And it takes its journey to a place that is beyond everything that you can cover up. So it can go underneath and go into a collage of, of, um, of, of experiences, feelings, thoughts, visions, memories. And so this is the uh, quote um, from the Zohar that I'm gonna to sing to. Oh, 
We now pass, thank you so much, Hazan Basia. Whoa, <laughs> that's going to be ringing in our ears and in our souls and in our dreams. And we now bring back to the stage Rabbi Jill, who's going to lead us in some dream practice. We're all going to get to do this practice together. Mm. Thank you, Shamira. And, and thank you again. Uh... Wow, Basha, uh, I, I can feel the soul flying away uh, and going up to the high realms as you, as you sing. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to connect to this text through your voice. So I want to invite us into a little practice. Um, and there are a lot of ways to, uh, to work with our dreams, uh, especially if there's an uh, image that we want to know more about. Uh, so this is one way, um, and um, it's uh, an imaginative exercise. It's an imaginal, uh, an exercise in the imaginal world that allows us to be drawn to a, a particular uh, dream and to see what we find there uh, when we return to it. Um, and I, I want to thank uh, my many uh, teachers of, uh, of the imaginal realm, uh, and particularly Dr. Catherine Shainberg. Um, and uh, also all of the, all of the uh, amazing uh, dream practitioners that I've been uh, blessed to learn from, uh, including my uh, Kohenet co-founder, uh, uh, Rav Kohenet Teashir. Um, and for this particular practice that we're going to do right now, I want to invite everyone to, if you're, if you're holding things or you know, otherwise sort of engaged in, you know, in the waking world, I invite you to just take a little bit of a, a pause. You might wanna close your eyes if you feel comfortable because this is going to be a, an imaginal exercise on the inside. And I invite you to take a breath, noticing the sensation of breathing. Take another breath and again, noticing the sensation of breathing. And begin to come to here and now, this moment, this place, this body. And allow your mind and heart to be drawn to a place from one of your dreams. It could be a recent one, as recent as last night. It could be an old one from a long time ago or anywhere in between. Maybe it's an image you find beautiful, potent, puzzling, startling. And I invite you to just sit with this setting. And before going to any characters or any story or anything like that in the dream, just where are you? Inside or outside? What's around that you might be able to see or hear or even smell? What feeling comes up in you in this place? And I invite you to ask this place, what are you teaching me?
and listen and see if there's an answer. The answer might come in words or not in words. It might come as an image or even just a feeling. See what answer comes when you ask, what are you teaching me in this place in my dream? Now I invite you to thank this place from your dream. And now think of a, a being from a dream. It could be from the same dream or a different one. Person, animal, plant, alien, rock, whatever is coming up. Notice again, what you see and hear around this being from the dream. Notice how you feel in the presence of this being. And just as you did for the place. I invite you to ask this being from the dream what do you want to tell me? What are you here to show me? Take a moment to listen for the answer. And offer your gratitude. And take a breath, letting go of the dream. And there's one final thing. If you feel called to, if it feels like something you would like to share, you could drop into the chat, the place or the being that you spoke to and what they said, or anything you learned about that, the wisdom coming from that particular place or being in your dream. And if you didn't get an answer, or you didn't get a response. First of all, I just wanna encourage you to just, that, that whatever happens in the dream world happens many times in many different ways. So if you forget a dream or if a dream doesn't make sense or you ask a question and it doesn't answer you, like it's, um, it's really good to practice sort of not being worried about it because if it's not clear, another dream will come and we'll clarify if there's something that's needed. So if nothing came, just you know, let, let those dream images go and another dream will have something to say. I'm gonna read a couple of these. The person in my dream showed that I've been a positive influence, that I'm a teacher in my own way. I dreamt of my mother, it was so real and so good to see her. 
I spoke to a great bat spirit that took me below a lake through underground waters. When I asked, what are you trying to tell me? They said, it takes trust to move through the many realms. Wow, I love that. It takes trust to move through the many realms. My ex-husband came to me soon after his death and in this practice, he just said to me, thank you for the forgiveness. The Pathfinder said, there's always a way to go. Wow. So these sorts of dream wisdoms you know, can come and then we can see how we live into them you know, in our waking uh, lives. Mm. You are enough is another message someone got. And grief is a measure of love. I laid my hands on an elephant's face and he told me grief is a measure of love. Nothing is permanent, but everything is eternal. Such good, such good truths in our dreams. So you can do this whenever you want. And uh, you can journal your dreams. It's good to write them down, come back to them. I like to come back to ones that are old. Sometimes a dream that didn't make any sense to me, I come back and poof, oh, now I get it. So I think maybe uh, we are ready for some Q and A, yes? Yes, we are. Whew. We're gonna move into the, to the Q and A portion. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for sharing their dreams. I know that's vulnerable to do. So I really want to thank people. Yes, thank you. And I also want to say thank you, Jill, for sharing the celebration of your book with all of us. Those of us who read the book know that there are sections of the book that talk about some of the science of dreams, some of the history of Jewish dream work, and then there's a huge section at the end, which is actually training you on how to have a dream group. And perhaps unlike some other books out there that are trying to give you one answer, or you know, if you see this in a dream, it means this, and you know, this is now my dream encyclopedia. This book is actually giving us skills to go out and use your teachings and take them even farther. And so while we can be inspired by you as a teacher, we can actually have this other layer of prophecy and revelation in our dream circles. And I've experienced that both with you and beyond your presence. And it's it's such a gift. And again, to go back to what Dory mentioned, it's really one of the things that makes this such a feminist um, and feminine way of, of dream work. And we're, we're just so grateful for, for all of your gifts. We're gonna switch into our Q and A portion of the evening. So what this means is if you have a question, um, whether it's a short question or a long question, you can type it into the chat. I will be uh, going through and selecting a few questions uh, for, for Jill to answer for all of us. And there's, there's no silly questions. Um, all questions are welcome and you know, we, we, we actually especially want silly questions. So if you have a silly question, please bring it. Uh, we, we, want to, we want to hear them. So I'm gonna start with my question and then there's a bunch of great ones coming in now. Can you say a little more about the role of the group in spiritual practice? Uh, you're a rabbi, you're a scholar, you, you can read Aramaic and yet you're telling us that the spiritual practice of dreaming is not just for someone who has some sort of enlightened experiences, but actually anyone can, with, with some guidance, with some structure, have a dream circle and actually support another person. And can you talk about that as a, as a spiritual practice and also maybe a democratization of spiritual practice in general? Yeah, thank you so much. It's a it's a it's a really uh, important thing uh, for me. Thank you, Shamira. Um, so, 
my experience of dreaming in community, right? That is dreaming and then sharing our dreams in smaller or larger groups uh, has been transformative. That there is something about dreaming that you don't always see the thing yourself. It, it helps to have someone else to reflect it to you. Um, and the particular, and, and, and I don't think that that um, relationship has to be exclusively with a therapeutic provider of some kind. It can be, and that can be amazing. Uh, but there are cultures, you know, where people wake up in the morning and everybody around the breakfast table shares dreams. And it's not a thing that is just sort of only for the expert. Right, but there is an assumption that talking about your dreams with other people is part of the process of dreaming and that your dream might have medicine for someone else or um, someone else might see something in your dream that you hadn't seen that might turn out to be important. Uh, and the particular group process that, um, uh, that I use, uh, which is influenced by, all, by a number of different uh, folks, um, including some who are on this call and uh, you know, Emma Shears here, and um, you know, Shamira, you and I have both studied with uh, Catherine Shainberg, um, and 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 there are others who use similar methodologies. But the the this dream circle I see as being like uh, the Talmudic statement that there were twenty four dream interpreters in Jerusalem, and I went to all of them, and all of them gave me an interpretation, and they all came true. Uh, you know, that's really how I see the the potential of a dream circle uh, that. Uh, when you are receiving sort of multiple facets of your dream that you're more likely to find in it, you know, the, the transformation or the healing or the reflection that you need. And the particular form of the dream circle, each person who is reading or um, uh, understanding the dream speaks in the eye as if it's their dream. Uh, and that helps to keep us in the presence and the body and the revelatory nature of the dream but it also means that the dreamer doesn't have to take on our perspective, right? We're coming from our own place, right? In, in offering an understanding of the dream. And the dreamer might think that's great or the dreamer might say that maybe that, that works for you in, in your dream of this dream, right? But, but you know, I think the dream is about something else. So, so that kind of provides a certain safety that allows for the sharing of the dream in community. And it's so, it's so great to do. And you will dream, you will remember your dreams better if you have someone to share them with. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a related question about activating dreams. So we heard Hazan Basia mention this idea of a rock and someone else is asking about mugwort and someone else is asking about the idea that you would ask for a question or ask for some sort of longing to show itself in the dream. So you can combine those or you can pick one. Okay. What about using sort of plants and elements in order to get yourself to dream perhaps, if that's what you, if that's what you meant by that? And also what about just asking a question into the dream? Yeah. Um, so I'll take the second one first, uh, which is that dream incubation, which is kind of a fancy word for asking for a particular kind of dream or a particular answer in a dream. You know, is an old Jewish practice, um, and you know there are some prayers in the book that come from traditional sources around that. Um, and my practice is I don't do that a lot. I tend to assume the dream world is going to send me whatever it wants to send me. I do it sometimes, and when I do it, I assume that whatever dream I get is the right dream, even if it doesn't appear to be about the thing that I ask. That that works best for me. Um, and and, I, and but it is a, it's a traditional practice and people can do it. And, and some people will get answered in very, very direct ways and others, you know, maybe more indirect ways. Um, in terms of using a substance to, um, you know, enhance your dreams, it's not something I do. It's not something that has worked for me. You know, I've tried a couple of them, you know, uh, mugwort and valerian and lavender, you know, there are different ones people use. You know, my dreams tend to do the same thing no matter what. So um, I, it's not, I'm not an expert in it, but it is something that works for some people. Um, yeah. All so. right. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to combine a couple more of these questions. Everyone who's sending in questions, if they're really, really great. Keep them coming. Um, so there's this question, if our souls leave our body when we sleep, to seek out Shekhinah, what is the source of our dreams? And I'd also like to combine that with, um, we also had a question about 
going down versus going up when we're dreaming? And is that the source of under Torah? Where are we going and where are we finding our dreams or where are they finding us? Or is there no we? Is it just our soul is here and then Shekhin is here? Draw us a map. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, this is mysterious and probably high above my pay grade, but I'll say something about it anyway. Um, I mean, the, what I love about the language of the Zohar is that the Zohar says that you don't visit the Shekhinah when you dream, you're actually inside the Shekhinah when you dream. Like the Shekhinah is the place you go when you dream. So I like that actually better than saying, you know, the divine presence sends us dreams. And, and more that, you know, there, there's, you know, there's a sacred sense of place in a dream. And so, so I do feel that there's a, you know, there's a, a sacred component, you know, kind of a cosmic component in my dreams. But the good news is that whether or not you believe that, this practice still works. Like it, it, like the dream will still do amazing things. It doesn't matter where you think it comes from. Like if you think it comes from your brain, great. If you think it comes from the shchina, great. Like it's it, the practice works no matter what. Um, but but I think of dreams as having their origin in our connection to the larger whole, which for me, you know, means the 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 divine connection. Uh, so that's what I think about it. But you can think whatever you want. But your dreams are still going to be awesome. I will. Thank you. <laughs> um, I really appreciated what you talked about with Dory in terms of what you do with the material of the dream that comes through and that we're going that we are going to honor it. And then there's different things you can do with that material. So in the exercise we just did, we talked to it. We asked it a question. Um, someone mentioned in the chat something about every character in the dream is you or every character is is a, a bot every body is the self mm -hmm. and can you say a little more about those questions and also about you know maybe you have a dream that you don't like or maybe there's something that's not that interesting what do we do with that um yeah. versus the more exciting stuff great um I, i'm going to take also the question uh, that i forgot earlier about up and down which jung says that whether you go up or whether you go down, it's still the vertical direction. Like it's still, you know, it's still a, a transformative direction. So I, I tend to go along with that. Um, in terms of, you know, what if I have a dream that I don't like, which by the way is most of our dreams. Most of the time we have dreams we don't like, you know, not necessarily because they're terrible nightmares, but because, you know, we're getting lost on the subway or something like that. Um, and, I tend to think of those dreams, I call them journey dreams, and I tend to think of them as um, ways that we are finding out what our challenges are, what our resources are, because often in those dreams we're problem solving, right? Oh, I'm lost on the subway, but I can ask this person, or I can, you know, climb up that ostrich over there, or, you know, you know however we're, we're problem solving in the dream. And often I find that we learn about what our resources are like from those dreams, even the ones where, you know, that are not so much fun, uh, there, are, there are still really treasures in those dreams to mine, I think. So it's, um, it's easy to get jealous of the sort of the amazing, you know, oh, I dreamed I was, you know, I dreamed I was at the heart of the sun, you know, and you know, you're like, oh, why, how come I can't dream about that? How, you know, how come I, I have to dream about, uh, you know, that I'm late to French class? Uh, you know, but, the, but the late to French class dreams also have a lot you know, a lot in them, you know, if you begin to, to pay attention to them. Somebody in the chat, I'm going to grab this one for a second, asked about um, dreams versus active imagination, which I think is a really great question. Um, dreams and kind of waking dream state or, you know, journeying, you know, meditative or journeying state um, are very similar. And some people work with them as the same. And one of the reasons that I, I really love dreams in a unique way is that the ego really isn't activated in the same way. That is, I'm, there's no part of me that's running the show in, in, a, you know, in a conscious directed way. I mean, there may be pieces of my ego in the dream, but there's, there's no you know, over, there's no director, right? Whereas for most of us, unless you know, we're incredibly uh, able to let go of our conscious minds, uh, for most of us, there is a director when we're doing a, a conscious imagination journey. Uh, so that's part of why I like dreams, because they're very honest that way. Um, Beautiful. So you, you asked something else. Yeah. Did you? No, maybe I got it. Okay. 
Okay, if you think of it, let me know. Um, if people, just so folks know, we're going to do this for another three or four minutes. So if you have any more questions, type them in the chat. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. I want to talk about this question about dreams as text. Hmm. And, you know, someone could read this book and not be interested at all in spiritual practice, but it's just a fascinating book. The stories in here could be, there could be a whole just entire book that's just like, essentially mythology that is just people writing down their dreams. And sometimes when I hear a dream, that's, I told you one, I think last week, that was just, is so strange. I was like, this just needs to be a story that everyone reads because it's so breathtaking and there's a, a thousand things it could mean. And it's just so important to be out there. Uh, the way this person phrased the question is, why are the dreams in the second part of your book so processed, polished, arboreal, and narrative when, when dreams are actually fragmentary, ta uh, patchy, and nonlinear, rhizomatic, and non-textual as described in, in, in the introduction? Yeah. And so uh, the question is also just what is the role of writing down these dreams and who should be reading them and for, ha for how long? Right. So... One thing I'll say about writing down dreams is that there really is no such thing as a dream. There's a report of a dream, right? Because whenever you report the dream, right, you've forgotten things or you added things to make it make sense, right? And of course, when you're writing a book, you know, people want the book to make sense. And so, you know, the dream narratives make sense. Um, and, you know, and that's, um, you know, in some ways, the, the price of waking up, right, we wake up, and then, you know, we want the dream to, to you know, to have a, a narrative structure that we can follow. But, um, and yet, I, the, you know, in the report of the dream, which is kind of the text that arises out of the dream, which is not the same as the dream itself, right, in that report of the dream, there is the residue of the mystery of the dream, right, which I, which I hope comes through in the book. And, you know, those, uh, those mysteries, are, are deeply relevant to us if it's our dream, but my experience is it's also very moving to other people, right? There, that there is, um, there's something about encountering these mysterious landscapes that even if it's not yours, right, at least for me, you know, and for many of the people that I've worked with, uh, there's something about someone else's dream that can awaken the sense of mystery in us as well. Um, so, you know, I, so I think, you know, for me, you know, reading, reading, you know, the mystery of a dream or even if it's not my dream is, you know, is really profound, you know, and, uh, and powerful. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I, if, you know, you might be somebody who dreams all the time, you might be somebody who dreams rarely. For me, that's changed a lot at different phases of my life. Uh, but if you're not dreaming, it's, it's great to be able to borrow somebody else's and uh, have, a, <laughs> you know, get to have a cool dream ride anyway. Amazing. I think I found the question that I, that you only partially answered, which is about when every character in the dream is a version of oneself. And I think that relates also to this other question is what if you see someone in a dream that you don't want there? And mm -hmm. do you have any advice for that, someone in that situation? Yeah, uh, let me take them both. And if I forget the second one, remind me. Um, so if you see somebody in a dream and you would prefer not to dream about that person, um, you can tell them not to come back. I, I can't promise it will work, but you can do that. And for many people, it does work. Like if you make a clear intention, like you're just not somebody I wanna see in my dream world, like, you know, you can do that. There is another way to deal with it. But you can also choose if you're open to it and it's not damaging for you, you can also choose to say, okay, there's someone or something in my dream I prefer is not there, right? But maybe they came for a reason. And maybe I can start to think about that reason, right? And that, and which of those approaches you take is up to you, right? That depends on your level of trauma around this person, right? It's, you know, that, you know, that approach is up to you. But there is, um, I mean, you have the possibility of inquiring more deeply, right? And, and this is actually a thing to do with nightmares. Nightmares can often turn into incredibly healing experiences, like if you're willing to kind of dive into the wave and, and face the nightmare. Um, but, you know, people ask me about ancestor dreams, like some of them, you know, your ancestor comes and you know, your loved one comes and it's fabulous and you're so happy to see them. And sometimes you're like, um, no, thank you. You know, you can, you can say no, thank you, you know, and if, uh, and, and hopefully they'll listen. I think that's going to be our last question. We're going to move to, is there anything else you want to add before we move to the slideshow? Um, 
Oh, somebody asked about lucid dreaming. So I'll just quickly say one last thing, um, uh, which is, yeah, I mean, lucid dreaming is a really cool experience. I don't seek it as an experience because I like it when my dream is driving. Like I find that lucid dreaming often is right before I wake up. One of my classic examples is one of my best dreams ever. I was in my twenties and I was walking on this road and I found a stable and I went in the stable and there were dragons in the stable. And I got on a dragon and I flew the dragon and the dragon found this garden and was flying over the garden. And I mean, it, this was really one of, you know, in my top five dreams ever. And I began to be able to direct the dragon with my mind. Like I had a kind of a lucid dreaming stage of this dream. And then I knew I was about to wake up, right? Because lucid dreaming is closer to waking state. Um, so if you lucid dream, it's awesome. All kinds of dreams are great. Um, and I tend not to seek lucid dreaming because I like the, I like where the dream is. I like where the, I like to see where the dream is taking me. Beautiful. Um, well, I, I really appreciate everyone who put all these really thoughtful questions in the chat. And I can tell that some of you have read the book and some of you, once you read the book, you will have your questions answered. And so we we encourage you to to buy one, buy one for your friend, buy one for your chavruta. And I'm gonna pass the mic back to you, Jill, so you can show us your slideshow. Tell us a little bit more about the making of the book. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shamira, for guiding us through the Q&A. And I know that there were many questions we didn't get to. Uh, you know, please feel free to, to um to you know to write me I, i'd love to i'd love to hear from people um uh so what you're about to see is a is a little video uh that is uh beautiful tiles with quotes from the book that i and press put together uh that i i really love uh and also some images that are meant to put us into a little bit of a dream world so uh so there are some uh some images interspersed here so if you're seeking a dream experience i hope this is it uh, and uh, just to just to give us a little bit of a dream breather, and I'll say that the song, uh, which is called John of Dreams, uh, here performed by the Wilderness Yet, uh, is a song I used to sing to my daughter every night before she went to sleep, and it's all about entering the dream world. Uh, so, uh, so enjoy it, and and uh, when when you get back, uh, we'll uh, we'll have a little bit more for you here.
Thanks, everyone. Uh, before we close, uh, I want to I want to invite forward the uh, the amazing uh, some of the amazing staff of Ion Press uh, who published the book, uh, who has lovingly uh, helped to uh, cull through dreams and uh, and make this book the the best that it could possibly possibly be. Uh, um, Eden Perlstein and uh, Penina Alberg Schwartz, to whom I owe such a huge debt of gratitude, who are going to say a few words. Thank you so much, Jill, and to everybody who had a hand in making tonight possible. It's so beautiful to explore the dream world together and to continue doing so. Um, my name is Penina, and I'm the managing editor at Ein Press. Um, and Jill, we just feel so lucky to have supported bringing this book into the world, um, a book that uh, you pointed out is more a book of dreams than a book about dreams. Um, and I was thinking about it today, the, the distinction is an important one, one of contact and experience, a distinction uh, that seems to come from Rabbi Jill's commitment to meeting the world with openness and curiosity and not like some other human approaches to dreams religion and power with the intention to impose an already crystallized interpretation on top of what is. Uh, and in Under Torah, Jill writes, this world is alive and seeks to be in dialogue with me. This is an orientation of compassion, one which seems to motivate so much of Jill's work from her teaching, her work with Kohenet, her dream work with individuals and groups and her writing, her beautiful writing. Uh, it's an approach that creates space for the transformation we need in our bodies, our communities, and our ecosystems. Um, and in her broader work and in this book, Jill teaches an attunement that can expand our notions of the sacred, which um, Dory Midnight also spoke about so, so beautifully. Uh, and this is really world changing work uh, since what we hold sacred has truly material effects on our lives and the lives of others. Um, I think this book was also world changing for me because it affirms the dream world as a place of questions, a place where messages can come through strangely and slantwise, um, a mode of transmission that is, of course, central to art and to us at Ayn in particular. Um, so we're just so grateful to Jill for her work in the world and uh, for inviting us into the dream world with her. Jill, thank you so, so, so much for allowing us to be a part of this really beautiful work in the world. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Eden, a co-founder of Ein and a longtime friend and collaborator of Jill's who'll say, say a few more words. Hello, thanks, Panina. Um, and thank you, Jill and Shamira and Dory and Basia and Renee and Rachel and everybody um, involved in putting this event on. Um, I'll just say a few words uh, about Ion Press um, for those of you not familiar with our um, new and budding project. Uh, my name is Eden Perlstein, and as Panina said I'm one of the co-founders and editors at IN Press. And for those hearing about us for the first time, IN Press is an, a new artist-run publishing platform, production studio, and research collective rooted in Jewish culture and emanating outward. We create and support work at the intersection of political imagination, speculative theology, and radical aesthetics. We publish online and in print and this is our first official book project, as well as the launch of our speculative theology book series, where we hope to feature writers and work exploring a plethora of potential spiritual futures from a number of different vantage points. Over the coming months, we will also be launching our radical aesthetics and political imagination book series with new publications from award-winning authors. And you can visit our website to check out our online journal and other digital publishing platforms. And we will be launching a new platform in the next week or two, so stay tuned. Our vision is to create a Jewish publishing space that fosters openness, experimentation, and creativity, along with a sense of history, tradition, and responsibility. Contrary to the scarcity narrative that is so pervasive around topics like Jewish continuity and community, Ion was started largely out of an acknowledgement of abundance. From our perspective, we're constantly amazed at the amount of deep creative work coming from artists, 
poets, musicians, scholars, activists, and rabbis, all reflecting on the timeless questions and contemporary issues that emerge from 21st century Jewish life. As publishers, we see our work as helping to gather and elevate these holy sparks. It is with this ridiculously high hope in mind that we are so honored to publish Jill Hammer's Under Torah. The perspectives Jill offers throughout this poetic and prophetic text are healing for the many rifts that have alienated us, not only from our deepest selves, but more importantly, from the earth, from the elements, and from each other. Jill's contention that dreams, rather than burrowing us deeper into our own tiny worlds of self-concern, can actually connect us with deeper and wider networks of community, including with the more than human world, is quite literally radical, meaning it is both rooted and reaching beyond itself. This book lays the groundwork for a more democratic approach to the divine presence in our lives, offering us all perspectives and practices through which we can recognize and respond to the call of spirit as she speaks to us through every nook and cranny of creation. I am a longtime student, friend, and collaborator of Jill's, and I consider it to be one of my few merits accrued in this world that I was able to play a small part in bringing this book to publication. May all of our dreams for truth, peace, justice, happiness, and togetherness nourish the ground of being and produce the sweetest fruits from the tree of life. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jill, for this wonderful work. And thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight. Please um, check out ionpress.org for a bunch of weird free stuff online and to purchase Jill's book and to stay tuned for a bunch of um, new things that we have um, brewing in the cauldron. I'm into that. Thank you so much, Eden and Panina. I'm, I'm overwhelmed really uh, by your support and thank you for taking such a, 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 a chance on this, on this book uh, of, of dreams. Uh, and I'm, I, I really see dreams as uh, a place where we can also receive solutions uh, to the problems in our larger world. And, and at this time when there are so many uh, things in the world that we're concerned about, you know, may dreams be a source of wisdom for all of us. Uh, I want to add uh, my thank you uh, to some of the ones that have been offered uh, to the JCC in Manhattan, to Alien Press, Kohenet, and Romamu for sponsoring uh, this evening, uh, to Kohenet and to the Academy for Jewish Religion for making spaces for dream circles and dream classes uh, in your, uh, uh, you know, in your spaces. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Rachel uh, Kunstad, to Kohenet Sarah Shamira Chandler, Kohenet Renee Finkelstein, Kohenet Dory Midnight, Kazan Basha Schechter, Eden Perlstein, and Panina Alberg Swartz for all that you did tonight to make this evening fabulous and, and like a dream come true for me. Uh, we miss Rabbi Shiriako Fight, who couldn't be here this evening. Uh, I want to thank again Rav Kohenet Teashir for being my Dream Circle partner and priestess co leader as well as Kohenet Kashir Halev Fife for her amazing, amazing support of the dream of Kohenet. Thank you to all of my dream teachers, to all the dreamers who offer their amazing dreams in the book so, so powerfully. And thank you to all of you for being here to support this book. I hope that you find goodness in it. I hope that you find goodness in your dreams. I hope you enjoyed tonight. Um, and uh, I just wanna close with a dream intention that the gateways above and the gateways below be open for us uh, during this night during all the nights to come. May doors of truth and doors of prophecy open for us. May we find healing and transformation in our visits to the dream world. May we lie down in peace and rise up in peace. May our dreams renew us and guide us through our days. And may the dreams we dream tonight and every night be full of wonder and truth and wisdom. So thank you to the dream world. Thank you to all of you uh, for being here. Uh, Amen, amen. This is our chance to throw, flood the chat with mazel tov, gratitude. How does it feel to have just been at, this is a book party. Have you ever been to a book party like this? How does it feel to have just been an hour and a half 
getting a taste of this book, getting a taste of this amazing, amazing teacher, this new publishing house. We invite you to flood the chat. And if you dare, briefly unmute and say Mazal Tov to our dear Jill. Mazal Tov. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Thank you, thank you. Mazel tov. 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 Mazel tov.